this is indeed a privilege and a pleasure, Bob. No, but it's, it's a privilege and a pleasure for me. That's what I meant. Oh. <laughs> so you're Noble Eggleston. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and, and you're such a success at everything you do. You're captain of sport at Yale and Harvard and here at Oxford and Cambridge. Oh, I just love England, you know. Well, last time we were here, Ma brought me a, a nice set of golf clubs. Oh, the good ones? Yeah, sure. Uh, Wentworth, Sunningdale, and some <laughs> others. Oh, they are particularly nice. And then you go on to become a great surgeon, a brilliant lawyer, a hero of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. Well, you've got to have a hobby. I suppose. <laughs> sure. Gosh, is that the time? I've got to fly because I had a little accident this morning. Yeah. One of my windscreen wipers fell off the um, car. What about it? Well, I promised I'd set his leg for him. He broke it. So. Sorry. It's been wonderful of you being here, and I feel sorry for Belle that she loses you in the story of little me. That's a little bit unlucky, isn't it? You see, you always hurt the one you love, the one you shouldn't hurt at all. What do you mean? Well, this morning I cut myself shaving. Oh. <laughs> Bob, I've got to go. Oh, Noble, it's been an honor and a privilege. You're so right. <laughs> Thank you. Noble Eggleston, ladies and gentlemen. It seems that Belle, Belle can't have Noble Eggleston, not right away anyway, not at the beginning of the story, because she lacks money and, and social position. But she's a very brave girl, our, our Belle. She leads all the people from the slum end of town in a revolt against mean old Amos Pinchley. He's the owner of the foreclosure bank, and he is the meanest man that ever lived. He eats Brussels sprouts just to rob the cabbage of its young. <laughs> He's as tight as a duck's armpit, and I'm frightened that I, I won't be able to deal with him if he, if he shows up, and I think that, 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 that that's him coming. Oh, there we are. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> keep me long here, boy, because I'm very busy at the moment. I'm... Scraping a wallpaper off my walls. Scraping the wallpaper off your walls. Are you redecorating? No, I'm moving. <laughs> well, uh, why are you moving, Mr. Pinchley? I've got homing pigeons, and I want to confuse them. <laughs> no wonder people are afraid of you. Afraid of me? <laughs> They've always been afraid of me. You know, before I was born, squirrels never used to hide their nuts. <laughs> Mr. Pinchley, isn't it true that in the plot of Little Me, Belle softens your heart and you become a reformed character? Shucks, you, you got me there, boy. I used to be the meanest man in town. Yes. I wouldn't spit down your throat if your back teeth were on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once a thief put his hand in my pocket and a moth bit him. Oh. <laughs> but all this changed when you met Belle. All this changed when I met Belle. I just said that. I wondered whether I'd heard that. <laughs> That's true, you know, because that little slip of a lass, El Between transformed me from a mean, miserable to a nice man. <laughs> you know, she fixed me so that I gave money to orphans. Uh, I gave clothes to the Salvation Army. Uh, <laughs> I even freed slaves oh. and I she made me so charitable that I did the most amazing thing a man could ever do and what was that I came on the Bob Monkhouse show <laughs> have you seen this contract how me can you get mm. you call me me <laughs> you don't know that it's kind of me son of a man hey, don't talk to me, me. Now, Belle finds out that her real love, Noble Eggleston, has gone to Flanders, fighting in the war there. So she hurries to France, and there she happens to meet probably the most lovable character in Little Me. He's a lad who's straight off the farm. He's never had a chance to talk to anybody except cows and, and chickens, and he's making up for lost time. He's a lovable guy, but a talkative guy. An American doughboy called Fred Poitrine. Oh, here he comes. Fred, Fred, over here, Fred. Oh. Hi, Fred. Oh, hi. Hi. Hi there. 
Nice to see you, Fred. Sure, sure. I'm Fred Petrine, U.S. Army, 647-293-76529. That's my serial number, in case you can't remember my name. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, would you like to sit down? Oh, sure. Is this a show? Thank yes, you. yes, certainly. Be seated. Boy. Really nice to see you. Gee whiz. <laughs> so you're here in France, are you enjoying it? Oh, sure. I'm having a great time with all the guys in the force there, the boys in the body, the barracks. Oh, Bert, he's my best friend. I talk to him in the barracks at the lights out. I talk to him about the farm, the cows and chickens and the eggs. I keep talking and talking and talk, talk, talking all night long. Last night, his gun went off right near my head, but it was an accident. Was it really? Well, it's nice to have a buddy. Sure. He promised he's going to show me what I can do with my bayonet. <laughs> you seem like a very sweet-natured fella. Sure. Well, I come down from home on the farm there, you see, where nothing gets your goat. Nothing gets your goat on the farm. Unless it's another goat. <laughs> right now, now you're over in France fighting World War I. Oh, gee, and guess who comes across? I know. But she brings all her girls with her as well, Miss Belle Poitrine. Belle Poitrine. Right. No, she becomes Belle Poitrine because she falls for you, Fred. Oh, gee. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. <laughs> and you get kissed for the first time in your life. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Don't you remember how oh, you sure. felt? That's right. When she kissed you? I remember. What did you say? Oh, I said... I spoke to her. You sang to her? Yeah. Oh, gee. Pardon me, miss, but I've never done this with a real life girl. Straight off the farm with an actual arm full of real life girl. Pardon me if your affectionate squeeze Fogs up my glasses and buckles my knees I'm simply drowned in the sight And the sound and the scent And the fear Of a real life past so many funny scenes and some wonderful songs and some lovely chorus work we come to the next stage in Belle's career she needs to win a, a noble Eggl Eggleston's heart and the only way she can do it is to achieve that final particular quality of fame and to that end she becomes a movie star of course she may have made a slight mistake there because in order to direct her films she engages the eccentric and sadistic German genius Otto Schnitzler <laughs> Schnitzler. Yeah, get ready to hate my guts because I already hate yours. <laughs> making moments is like making love. You do it when you fap on a chair. When you finish, you're black and blue. You're standing here, is that? Well, that's a chair. Why did I give you the order? Very good. I am the director of this film. Of course you are. Move! I'll move! Can I get an order move? Yes, of course. In Herr fact, Schnitzler. I'll follow you. A pleasure to be with you because I know that you're a great director. You've made many fine, fine films. Many, many fine, fine films? Yes, yes. <laughs> You made that great film only two can play. That's right, for the Harry Stornham band. Yes, yes. <laughs> you saw the picture? Yes, I, I, I did. I, I, I'm, I'm desperate to know your opinion of certain uh, aspects of the cinema. For example, what do you think of uh, nudity in the cinema? It'll never work. It never, never, never work. Never, never work. Why? Oh, you've always the chance of catching yourself in those tip-up seats. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it. May I say, in every one of your films, you are masterly. Masterly. No. In Master of the World, I was masterly. Oh, in Master of the World, you were masterly. In Man About Town, I was manly. In Man About Town, you were manly. In Blood and Sand, 
I was pretty sad. <laughs> well, I, I think you're absolutely brilliant. I have nothing but admiration for you. What do you want to be in one of my movies? I do very much. What's your next picture going to be? My next picture actually will star. I'm going to film it in this country. In here? It's going to star in this order. Yes. Cliff Richard. Cliff Richard. Yourself? Me. And Bernard Manning. In that order? Yeah. Cliff Richard, me, and Bernard Manning. Mm. What's the picture going to be called? It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, May I sit down? Yes, please, do it. Silence! Somebody's gonna be so bad! I can't so bad, so bad, so angry, I can pull my hair out! <laughs> you have a hard time doing that, you got no hair. Oh, no! You think so? I think so. You watch this. Russell. I know what you're going to say. What? I'm going to take that off. <laughs> <laughs> Russ, we've only seen a, a glimpse, a sample of the characters that you parade across the stage of the Prince of Wales Theatre, and they've been marvellous. And thank you very much for showing, us to, uh, showing them to us. But the real Russ, can I come back to him? Who? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> can you make one last lightning change and, and take us back to the real Russ and give us a song as only you can sing it? What a nice idea. My pleasure. Oh, we have everything. We've got the band, we've got the lights. All sure. we need it's is... It's been a great thrill, Bob. This is a great show. It's got a great atmosphere. You know? It's like a party. Atmosphere is a good title. You're right. <laughs> Smooth. Smoother. Uh, Smooth. <laughs> Mr. Glib. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, here's, uh, here's my very special guest, Ross Abbott, with uh, his latest record. And, of course, you've already guessed the title. Atmosphere.